Harvesting is an occupation as old as mankind. Since the misty origins of civilization, we have reaped the forests, harvested crops, domesticated animals, and without understanding very much about it, exploited yeast to make wine and cheese. Today, harvesting enzymes is a $400 million a year industry. Enzyme, meaning in yeast, is a remarkable biochemical catalyst. And virtually all chemical reactions in our bodies, including mac attacks, are catalyzed by enzymes. One of our major foodstuffs is starch. And starch is actually a sugar, a polysaccharide, a naturally occurring polymer. These individual sugar molecules eat with the molecular formula C6, H2O5, ultimately provide our bodies with energy. But before the body can metabolize the polysaccharide, starch, it must be converted to the monosaccharide, glucose. And this the stomach cannot do. So as soon as the nose detects food, the enzyme, amylase, is released in the salivary glands. And in the pancreas. Amylase acts like chemical scissors, converting the starch to the disaccharide, maltose. Maltose must be reduced to the monosaccharide, glucose. As maltose enters the small intestine, the enzyme maltase, released from the pancreas, begins the finest cut, producing the monosaccharide, glucose. In this example, enzymes have facilitated the splitting of a polysaccharide in a sequential process. Theoretically, in the presence of water and acid, the cleavage could take place without an enzyme if the body could produce high enough temperatures. Remember that all chemical reactions, whether exothermic or endothermic, require energy to boot reactants over the energy barrier. Unless activation energy is supplied, it would take centuries to digest a hamburger. Alas, we can't wait that long. So evolution's answer to low body temperature was the enzyme which significantly lowers the energy barrier and allows the chemical reactions to take place rapidly. To appreciate how an enzyme lowers activation energy, we have to examine both its form and function. Enzymes are globular proteins consisting of a protein chain wound up and held together by intermolecular forces. Let's look at the unwound molecule. It is the sequence of amino acids in the protein chain that determines where intermolecular forces are strongest and therefore determines the shape of the enzyme. To keep things simple, we'll now use this streamlined model. It is the specific shape of the enzyme that enables it to recognize its specific and complementary substrate. Substrate is a term for any molecule that the enzyme targets on, whether a carbohydrate or another protein. After the enzyme recognizes its substrate, it holds its companion in the correct orientation along the reactive site. Now the substrate, bound in a straitjacket, is susceptible to chemical attack. Next, a coenzyme in the form of a metal ion may be necessary to catalyze a reaction. In this example of protein hydrolysis, the positive cobalt ion attracts the electronegative oxygen atom and nitrogen atom of the substrate. The action of the coenzyme then weakens this link pin carbon nitrogen bond. 
the weak in bond, vulnerable to attack by water. The result? Two new molecules. Because their shape is different, these molecules can escape this bondage, leaving a reusable enzyme that continues to seek out new substrates. Enzymes such as sucrase are named after the substrate that they operate on and are generally given the suffix "-ase". Sucrase helps convert table sugar or sucrose into glucose and fructose, releasing energy. Like Olympic athletes, each enzyme is a specialist in the event it enters. Sucrase breaks down only sucrose and nothing else. Lipase helps convert lipids into fatty acids and glycerol. In Enzyme Olympics, there are no decathletes. And that is what makes the enzyme so attractive to commercial sponsors. It serves one specific function efficiently. For our purposes, we will survey but a few commercial applications for two large classes of enzymes. The proteases, which are protein hydrolyzing, and the carbohydrases, which are carbohydrate hydrolyzing. One group of proteases is used in the manufacture of detergents to get rid of those unspeakable stains. Another group, the rennets, are used by the dairy industry for processing milk and cheeses. Together, these two groups make up about 40% of the commercial market. The carbohydrases are enzymes used for starch conversion. Two industries dependent upon carbohydrases are the breweries and bakeries. The carbohydrates class accounts for about 20% of the market. Sources of enzymes can be as varied as pigs and pineapples. Pig bellies provide proteases used as milk coagulants in the production of cheese. And you thought cows produced cheese. The pineapple provides a protease as well, only it's used as a meat tenderizer. Still, the most abundant sources of enzymes are microorganisms. And the preparation of Bacillus subtilis to produce alpha amylase typifies an industrial process. These microorganisms are grown in a sterilized liquid nutrient broth with pH, temperature, and aeration of the culture are rigorously controlled. After a few days of fermentation, the microorganisms are filtered out and the broth is evaporated to yield about 5% excreted enzyme. The alpha amylase is then packaged for distribution. Biochemists are constantly searching for enzymes to outstrip the performance of existing ones. And where they can't find these microorganisms in nature, genetic engineering may yet harvest the biggest payoff. 